Okay, welcome everyone. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, today we're going to talk about steep slope roofing, uh, meaning roofing that isn't a flat roof, that isn't a membrane roof. These are regular shingles, standing seam metal like in this picture, slate, that kind of thing. Um, you know, uh, this is one of the areas where we've had uh, a lot of expense and a lot of our clients have gone through a lot of trouble with existing roofs that we've had to help them fix or completely replace. Um, I actually think we may have spent more money repairing roofs in, as warranty items than on any other thing in our company. And I'm sure our clients have spent more money repairing and replacing roofs uh, than anything else that they've had to do. So it's a pretty important topic. It's, it turns out that it is easy to make serious mistakes with a roof. And uh, hopefully we can get past a lot of those with the details we talk about today. Um, we'll talk about some solutions to common issues that we've run into over the years. Uh, designers can make it really easy to make a roof work or they can make it into a difficult proposition so we'll talk about some of the things that uh, designers can do to help us and also we'll talk a little bit about the special aspects of the various materials because each of them has their own little thing. So when we talk about a steep roof we mean a roof that has over a 4 inch rise and a 12 inch run. Anything under that you've got to start looking at specialty materials. Uh, regular skylights, regular shingles, they all work at a four inch rise in a 12 inch run. Um, they work by gravity, right? The water runs off one shingle, hits the next, and runs off to the next one. And even when the wind's blowing, because we overlap the shingles, not too much water gets up in there and they usually don't leak. Uh, if you get down much under a 412 pitch, um, then all these things that work by gravity stop working. Uh, the gravity isn't strong enough to overcome the wind or the snow or the ice. Um, so you have to switch over to different types of roofing. One of the things that we always want to mention is that there's really good documentation, really good manuals. Um, all the uh, national associations of contractors have books that tell you how to do different types of roofing. Manufacturers publish these guidebooks, which we have. I mean, there's um, each of these books has about a thousand, sorry, uh, <clears throat> details in it. Um, let me go back. Each of these has maybe a thousand details, um, different ways you can do every different aspect of a roof. So if you're puzzling about how do we connect this to this, um, I probably have a book on the shelf in my office that I can help find a detail for you. Um, so here's our agenda. We're going to cover seven different topics, um, and hopefully it'll go reasonably quickly. Uh, when I t say overall topography, I'm really talking about the framing. What's the shape of the stuff under the roof? Uh, you can get yourself in trouble before the roofer even arrives if the framer frames something like the circled area in this picture. Uh, the framers had the valley hit the side of the building right at the point at the corner. So in the picture on the right you can see a pile of leaves would build up there because there was really no room for them to run out. And then you'd get two inches of water built up behind it and any little pinhole back in there would start leaking. Sure enough there was a pinhole back in there and uh, w the, the way around that is to just frame that point away from the very corner of the building. So our general recommendation is to go out about six inches. And you can see if you run your valley about six inches away from the corner, there's no way for leaves to build up in there. It all washes right out. Snow and ice usually run out. So it works very well. Um, there is a little bit of a weird triangle down below that point where the roofing has to fold down onto the next level. But the roofers have been able to deal with that really well. Because we use ice and water shield in all our valleys, you just fold that down over that corner. And then anything you put on top to protect that from uh, being degraded by the UV light will take care of anything. Um, at the bottom of uh, any valley, you can get the roofers to do this, even the ones with the, uh, with the metal roof and the, um, the V shape in the bottom. Um, you can see this will stay cleared out. So again, just try to keep six inches away when you're framing out these things. Uh, here's another important thing. Um, if you put a skylight or a chimney in the middle of a valley, you're going to have trouble. Um, with skylights, it's actually pretty easy to change, right? I mean, you're going to be building this, this well with tapered sides in it. So if you need the skylight to go down the roof, you can go down a little bit. Or if you need to go up the roof, you can go up a little bit. And in most rooms for most clients, these are all pretty much the same in their mind. So it's pretty easy to deal with. Um, you know, obviously this skylight, uh, I'm up here taking a picture because it's leaking. 
and it's because there's three inches of leaves built up against it. Now, chimneys aren't very easy to move, um, but in some cases you can actually move the roof. Uh, in this particular one, we have a big joint in the middle of our valley. It, it doesn't leak. It's working fine. It was just a lot of work for the roofers. There's a bunch of extra connections and joints in there that didn't need to be there. In this particular case, I think we could have overframed the roof a little bit and made the valley run past the chimney in one straight shot. It probably would have worked a little bit better. Uh, again, this is something that can be sorted out well ahead of time if you and the framers and the roofers all have a conversation. So these are all ways to make it a lot easier to get the roof done correctly. Already done with section one. Uh, again, please, if you have any questions or any thoughts, please uh, speak up. Um, drip edges are something that we started insisting on about 15 years ago because we were seeing a lot of wood rot on fascia boards. And we, we've asked roofers for, for that whole time to put them on the entire perimeter of the roof, both at the eaves and up and down the rakes. So here's a house uh, in uh, Alexandria where we've got drip edge on the rakes. Um, it actually got added to the code uh, in 2012 uh, edition. So in Maryland and DC, it's required to put drip edge on all the perimeters of all roofs. Um, and we think it's a great idea anyway, so that's no big deal for us. In Virginia, it's not code, but it is in our subcontractor agreement for roofers. So uh, it should be standard on any roof. And it's not very expensive or difficult to do. You know, aluminum drip edge is in stock at home centers, lumber yards, roof places. And uh, the three primary colors you can get in aluminum match well with almost any roof. It's a pretty narrow profile anyway, but between white, brown, and black, you can match most anything. So well, quick point we'll get into a little bit more later. Eve's membrane for ice damming is pretty important. Um, you know, when, you, when your house looks like this, uh, you, you need to have ice dam protection. And uh, it's also true that even if you do ice dam protection, if you don't do the drip edge, you can still have problems. So here's one of these rotted fascia boards that we replaced uh, at our expense about three years after we built this place because there's no drip edge. So we got to do both. Good idea to fold it over the edge, uh, the ice dam membrane, and then put the drip edge on top. Uh, we think that works better for ice dams. And one other important thing about drip edge, it should be long enough to get down into the gutter. But there are situations on our jobs where we, we run into it where we can't do that or we don't get it done. Uh, in particular, this happens a lot with these um, these hangers that screw onto the fascia board, it, you, you can't really tuck that up far enough under the drip edge and still put the screws in. So they tend to be installed a little bit below the drip edge. Or when we have our larger houses and you slope the gutter, it can slope far enough that it gets out from under the drip edge. When that happens, we just need to add another strip of metal that joins the two. Uh, if you don't, you end up with a situation like this where you're, you're really messing up the wood materials below because so much water is getting behind. It's pretty simple to just add a strip of metal. That's also in our subcontractor agreement, so the roofers should be ready to do that in their contract. All right, all done on edges already. Okay, underlayment. Um, underlayment. Underlayment is felt paper, only now there's like 12 different products, so we have to call it by a general name. Um, what's the purpose of underlayment? You know, why, why do we use that? Protection. Yeah, during construction, we want to dry the, dry the house in. Yep. Um, protection during, after construction, probably too, right? Um, yeah, I think it does, does, really does two things. It allows you to stop the rain pouring in while you're building the house before they actually put the roof on. So pretty important for that. Um, and then uh, I didn't really realize this until uh, I was the one answering the phone in the rainstorms. Um, Water does blow through some kinds of roofing, particularly the ones that have a lot of texture like slate or uh, sh shakes, cedar shakes. Water does blow up into those roofs. And the underlayment, it plays a really important role. Um, when the water blows past the top layer, the underlayment is there to protect. And uh, if there's big holes in the underlayment, sometimes you have issues. So um, all those things uh, mean that our, our underlayment should be watertight. 
um, particularly when it's the only roof during construction. Um, one, uh, not, not that big important point, but a nice thing to know, um, a lot of underlayments are not permeable. So ice and water shield material does not allow water vapor to go through it. So there can be no drying up through ice and water shield. If you cover an entire roof with it, you have to be able, that assembly has to dry in another direction. And so for that reason, it's better to have a fully vented roof if you're going to um, use an impermeable underlayment. So and it isn't just ice and water shield. A lot of the synthetic underlayments that we'll talk about are also not permeable. Um, this is important. If you're doing a metal roof, the, uh, like if you're doing a copper roof, you can't just use regular galvanized staples or button cap nails because that, if that metal ever touches the copper, it will corrode the copper. Same thing with aluminum. So if you know you're putting down a copper roof or an aluminum roof, you got to use the right fastener. Stainless steel for either or copper for copper or aluminum for aluminum. Um, all right, let's talk about some of these underlayments. Felt is the traditional one. It comes in two different weights, number 15 and number 30. Uh, they're, um, you know, it is permeable for what that's worth, so you can use it in any assembly pretty safely. Uh, it used to be inexpensive when oil was $28 a barrel, but for a while there it was more expensive than some of the synthetic underlayments, so you got to keep an eye on that. Um, it is proven in the sense that uh, it's been out for a long time and we know what it's going to do. Right? It's, it's not going to just fall to pieces underneath your roof, um, which cannot be said for everything. Um, it is proven that if you leave it on a roof for 60 days and you get a windstorm, it's probably going to tear off. So it's not really an ideal material in a lot of ways. It's just a known quantity. Um, you know, I remember some of, the, some of the bigger jobs that we did that took a long time. We'd come out and redo the felt halfway through because we just knew it wasn't going to last the whole way. Uh, so it's not very strong. It is easy to tear. It's common to find leaks during construction, which can be a drag. Uh, but it is, a, as I said, it's a traditional known quantity. Uh, these synthetic underlayments, there's a few different brands of them, um, are the latest thing. They're, they're easier to put down. They come in a wider roll. They're very thin, so a single roll has much, many more lineal feet. Um, so they're easier to handle and, and quicker. Uh, as I said, for a while they were less expensive. I mean, now it's sort of, it uh, goes up and down. Um, they're very, very strong. So you put this down with cap nails, it's going to be there for the duration of your project. It's not going to blow off. Um, the two things that I have that I'm not sure about them, one is some of them can be really slippery. Like I actually fell on this roof um, and, and landed on the roof, not on the ground, so I'm happy about that. But uh, you got to be careful with that. I mean, we don't want to accidentally tell someone to use something and then find out it's really dangerous. Um, the other thing is that I, we just don't know how these are going to hold up until they've been out for a couple of decades. Um, I know there have been some synthetic underlayments in the past. GAF made one. Uh, if you've ever taken off a roof with that, it's just a pile of crumbled up stuff underneath. I mean, it just falls apart. So hopefully these last. Um, I guess we're figuring they probably will, but we just don't know yet. What are they made out of? These are mostly made of plastic. Um, they're coated. They're like Tyvek with an extra coating, kind of stuff like that. Yeah. Go ahead. So if you if you move stuff at it, that could act like um, like the final wallpaper on the exterior wall. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It could. Um, it could. Yep. If your roof's not vented, so you get a buildup of moisture at the deck level. Um, that would happen in the winter when that's the cold side. Uh, in our area, for the most part. In the, in the summertime, all that moisture will come back through uh, your assembly, but it's still better to have it vented, everything else being equal. So do we have a standard? No. Every one of those has to be addressed individually. So here's a, here's a really, really good idea when you're putting down underlayment, and this is important, and a lot of roofers don't do this, and we have to tell them this. Um, the underlayment needs to run up the sidewall because water can blow through step flashings. So uh, I, I usually like to ask for six to eight inches. I think that's what we have in our subcontractor standard. Um, I think 
I don't think you really need that much, but if you do put that much on, then even after the four inch tall step flashings are installed, you can still see it. So it just makes it easier to QC. The other thing is, and this is this picture is perfect. Uh, this is probably about six inches here, and here, you know, they got a little off with the knife. Um, this is still fine. You still have four inches, but if you ask for four inches, you might get two inches or one and a half inches, and then you're probably probably not getting what you need. So let's just ask for six to eight inches. Um, make sure we turn it down on the rakes. Uh, we've got to protect the edge of the sheathing and the top of the trim over there. Sometimes people cut it off and again they get off by a couple of inches and then pretty soon you don't have any protection on that edge at all. Um, it's better to ask them to fold it over. When we put the drip metal on top, um, we can trim it off and uh, it's better to have it folded over. So let's talk about ice guard. There are, uh, you know, there's a hundred different kinds of ice guard. But one of the most important differences is whether it's compatible, uh, whether it's a high temperature material or not. So the regular ones are not, uh, you, you get them much above 200 degrees and they literally start melting and running out of the roof. So if we have a copper roof or a dark colored steel roof, those can easily get to those temperatures. So we always want to use a high temperature underlayment under a metal roof. Um, the other interesting thing is if, if you read the information about them, the white covered ones uh, will last a lot longer uncovered than the black ones. So I've talked to uh, some engineers on the commercial side, and uh, apparently these black asphalt things, if you keep them in the sun, if they get hot enough, it can really damage them. Um, and on a roof, it's really impossible to shade them. So generally speaking, we're usually using this, this actual material, the Carlisle 300 HT with the white cover. It seems to hold up better. So we started talking about this. Here's an example of putting the ice guard on after the fascia board, turning it down. This one might even be over an inch. Um, you want to go about an inch, enough to stick on it, and then, but not be showing. You know, if the drip edge covers it, great. The gutter will cover it if the drip edge doesn't. But uh, you want to turn it down and stick it to the front of the fascia board. That way, if we have any ice damming and water's actually coming back up under the drip edge, it, there's nowhere for it to go. You're still looking at ice and water shield. So this is, a, this is an example of a place where water got up under the drip edge and into the soffit of my house uh, during snowmageddon. So again, lap it down on the fascia board, no issue. Now, not all of our houses have fascia boards. Um, sometimes it's hard to sequence. The manufacturer's directions for most of these materials say to stick it on top of the drip edge. I think that's second best, but it still works pretty well. Uh, so if you, if you don't have a fascia board, put the drip metal on first and put the ice and water guard on top of that. That's okay. This has to be redone. So if you're, uh, if you're cornice, people go crazy and cut off all your ice and water guard. Uh, you're going to have to be back up there reworking it. Enough said. All right, here's an interesting thing. Um, in the code book, it says install ice guard membrane to a point 24 inches inside the exterior wall line. So if this is our exterior wall line, and then this is a three foot wide piece of ice guard membrane, you think we got 24 inches? Maybe, very close. So I think you're gonna be putting in two strips of ice guard membrane on a lot of our projects. Anytime you have more, much more than about an eight inch overhang, you're really not looking at 24 inches over the wall. Um, Pretty easy to do though. Uh, a lot of them are very close and you can just put in half a roll, um, which you can either use a circular saw and literally cut it with a blade that you'll never use again, uh, or you can buy Grace's 18 inch wide version. So it's, it's not that hard to handle. It is in our subcontractor agreement and you just have to make sure it gets done. And why is that 24 inches important? Uh, the, I think the theory is that that uh, 24 inches over the wall is far enough where the ice damming is not going to occur. It all happens in that last bit. And then above there, you're in the melting zone because of the bad insulation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, good rule of thumb and definitely the law. It's a good question. Uh, we also use it in valleys. Um, you know, ice guard membrane has this nail sealing property, so it's perfect where you're going to have to be concentrating all the water and you have all the. Um, all the nails in the valley. It's, it's good to have all those nails sealed up by this material. Um, with some kinds of roofing, slates, uh, wood, 
the hips are actually pretty vulnerable because they catch a lot of wind and they have these individual pieces that are kind of laying on top of each other. So it's easy to blow water through those. Probably a good idea to put a strip of it up there. Uh, you can even do the entire roof. Um, slate roofs, I actually think it's a pretty good idea. Uh, slate roofs do let a fair amount of water through in the wind. And uh, you know, as long as you vent the roof, this is no issue. Um, and if you're paying for slate, you probably won't even notice what this costs, uh, which we'll talk about later. And here's one other uh, little interesting thing. Um, after a few years in the sun, uh, ice guard membrane really sticks to the bottom of shingles. And uh, it's, it can be almost impossible to get them off. I mean, it took uh, three guys, uh, I think four days, to clear off three squares of roof here when we had to do a repair. So good idea. Uh, some of our roofers put another layer of felt on top of the ice guard membrane just to make it possible to re-roof later. Uh, definitely not something we normally have to worry about, but a nice touch. So I got into this a little bit already. Um, different ice guard membranes have different amounts of time that you're allowed to leave them exposed. It can be as low as one month. And uh, some of our projects will be closed in. The final roofing will be on top within a month. But some of our projects, it can be four months. right? So that uh, Carlisle 300 is, is four months. Um, that's good material. Uh, if you don't use that, you can end up having this kind of thing where on a hot day you get up there and you're just sliding off the roof. Um, we had to recover this whole roof. So uh, live and learn and uh, use the stuff that's appropriate for the length of the time your project will be open. Uh, this is a house where we knew about the problem and looking at this roof, uh, we knew it was going to take a long time for just a couple of select craftspeople who were really good at this type of roofing. I mean, we knew this roof was going to be open for months. And so the roofer just did a nice job. They put down, uh, we, it, first of all, we used ice and water on the entire roof. And then they also actually covered it with a synthetic underlayment. And so here they are halfway through. They're putting that over top of the ice guard membrane just to protect it for the four or five months till we can get this whole thing done. I thought that was a nice touch. OK. Um, so when we transition from a steep slope roof to a low slope roof, which happens a lot on our remodeling projects, right? We're adding a low slope roof addition to a, a house that has a regular slope. Um, that, that's a situation where you need ice guard protection. Um, you'll get piles of leaves. Um, I mean, I've seen, this, <laughs> I've seen this enough times that I now understand. People really don't actually go up on their roof and think about whether they should get their roof cleaned. Um, you know, I'm on this roof taking this picture because it's leaking in the snowstorm. Um, I'm on this roof taking this picture because it's leaking in the snowstorm. I mean, you can imagine this. I'm standing on a low slope roof. Somewhere in that huge pile of snow there, we transition over to a steep slope. So we needed ice dam protection in that area. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I think the key is that it can't just be a few inches tall, right? Um, to my way of thinking, the best way to do this is really to just run the low slope membrane well up the steep slope area. Uh, you want to be maybe. 12 to 18 inches vertical uh, above the low slope area. So uh, we were on this roof. Uh, we were redoing the steep slope on this. Someone else had run this EPDM years ago. I, I, saw the, uh, I saw the ice guard membrane came down right to the edge. And I thought, well, I wonder how far up the rubber goes. Answer, not far. Um, I think this was an area that was vulnerable to having an ice dam leak. So we actually extended the EPDM up the roof and another important point is um, most ice guard membranes are asphalt based and they should not be adhered to EPDM. They're not compatible. It'll damage the EPDM. So um, go up further with the EPDM. And then there's a, you can either put something to separate it, like a strip of aluminum, or you can use a special ice guard membrane that is compatible with EPDM. And there are a couple of those out there. Another approach is to just run it up high. And instead of running the regular roofing way down close, just keep it way up out of the snow and, snow and ice area. Then there's no issue. And here we are using a piece of plastic to separate the ice guard from the EPDM. All right, any questions on underlayment? OK. OK, so sidewall connections are interesting. We, we end up. Uh, we do these a lot of different ways because we're remodeling. But I'm going to go through what I'll call our sort of new construction method. 
when we're building the wall and the roof. We'll talk about the ways to handle this. Um, and this is an addition we did in 1994. Um, I was really proud of this project. I was a lead carpenter. Um, so I was really bummed when they called us a couple years later and there was a windy ice storm and water was coming through the step flashing along the edge here <coughs> into a closet below. Um, I didn't really realize water could blow up through, through step flashing, uh, but it does. Um, and uh, one of the other big issues we've had besides things going through the step flashing and no underlayment is when the wall finishes are not put in front of the roof finishes. So in this case, we have Tyvek on the wall. Water gets on the Tyvek, and it runs down behind the step flashing. So what should have been done is the Tyvek should have been cut, and all the step flashings tucked up underneath the Tyvek. And what definitely shouldn't have been done is tucking the window behind the step flashing, because that is definitely going to leak. Um, so uh, and here's another picture of that. I mean, you can just see if you're a drop of water running down the Tyvek, where are you going? Not onto the roof. You're going down into the house. So this is an uh, important quality point for us. Um, roofing has a very high turnover. People who do step flashing, uh, sometimes it's their first job or their first month or their first year. And we really have to get up there and explain to them, this Tyvek has to be in front of the step flashing or we're going to have a leak. So a few key things here. Um, we'll just jump into them. Um, you know, we're going to have to replace roofs. Um, we've had a lot of clients, but we've had long enough where we're replacing roofs that we did. That, there's nothing wrong with it. They just wore out. I mean, people have our phone number and they keep it. So it's really nice to set things up so it's possible to redo them. Um, with siding, you can usually kind of wiggle step flashings in and out from underneath them, no matter how low the siding goes. Uh, but I really love this detail uh, that Hardy publishes, where they have an extra piece of metal added, a Z-shaped piece. And that covers the transition. And that allows you to easily rework the roof. And it also gives us the two inches of space between the bottom of the hardy and the top of the roof that hardy requires. Um, this is an example of a roof that's going to be really hard to work on later. Uh, we have uh, you know, fake stone and stucco are run almost down to the roof level. So it's going to be very challenging to replace that roof. The roof should really go up six or eight inches up the wall. It's going to be hard to deal with. Here's how we have been starting to handle this with stucco. Uh, we use a piece of metal a lot like that hardy picture, and uh, we just tuck that in under the stucco. It gives us a, a space to work. Here's a close-up of it. Uh, the two-inch clearance is actually pretty important. Um, really have seen a bunch of issues with this. Uh, fiber cement siding absorbs water, and it blows the paint off, or it freeze thaws and falls apart. Um, I mean, this is certainty siding. I don't think this really happens so much with Hardy in our climate, but I have seen pictures from places that aren't that much colder than here where it does. So probably better just to do what they say and give us two inches of clearance. Same thing for stucco, same thing for cedar. They all want two inches of clearance. All right, <clears throat> that takes care of the, uh, the clearance and the concealment. Um, Kick-out flashing is, a, is sort of a term of art that's uh, come on relatively lately, right? It's, it's, uh, what it means is the last piece of step flashing at the bottom of a roof. So on this roof, we have this panel design. Uh, we have step flashings that run down along here. The water runs down the inside corner of those step flashings when the wind's blowing against the wall, right? You get to the last step flashing. And in this uh, particular house, that last step flashing is behind the finishes. So water's running down that joint, and it goes behind the wall finishes. Um, and it, in this case, it caused a fair amount of damage in just a year. Um, so we really don't want that to happen. Um, here's another uh, same situation. We had someone applied a, um, you know, there's a sort of a trim band that went around this house. And it, it died on a roof. And because it's over an inch thick, uh, I guess they did, couldn't figure out how to get that last step flashing out onto the face of it. So they left it tucked in. Clients called us. There's water dripping in through their window, and it all came from the roof above. So this piece down here, this is the kick-out flashing. It's a piece of preformed metal or plastic that you buy at the store. You have them at Home Depot for $5. You have them at the roof center. You can mail order really nice ones. Um, and it, all it does is take the water off of the step flashing and throw it out away from the wall into a gutter if you have it. Um, so it's a, it's a great idea. 
Uh, I, the first time I saw them, I thought, wow, that's going to look really funny. But in the context of a whole house, you can barely see it. It doesn't look that funny. Uh, you know, we have clients who are very particular who have these all over their house and haven't really mentioned anything. So they, they work great. They're super important on stucco, right? If you, if you had water going behind that stucco, where would it come out? It would, it would be going all the way down through, getting everything wet until the very bottom of the wall. Now, on a traditional siding installation, um, we would do it like this. We would have, you'd pull out the last step flashing and tuck the piece of siding behind it, because siding's really thin. It's usually easy to do that. Um, just doesn't work that great, though. I mean, this, this doesn't, your house doesn't fall apart if you do this. But you can see someone climbing up there on a ladder and smeared a bunch of goop all over there just to try to keep water from running down the siding and staining the siding. So it's much better to use the kick out flashing, if only for this aesthetic concern. And it turns out that all the manufacturer's instructions say to use it. Hardy says to use it. It's in the code now. So it's, re it's required. Um, go ahead, Dante. Um, so so if, if, uh, the step flashing is, if the siding comes into the step flashing where, let's say, a good bit of it has to be notched, uh -huh. that's, that just becomes a, a caulking issue. Oh, because you have to notch the yeah. step flashing for the vertical leg of the yes. kick out. I mean, you have to notch the siding. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yep. That's why they made fine tools, I think. Yeah. That's a good question. Because, um, I, I mean, I've done 100 houses like this uh, with the, the piece sticking out in front of the siding. And other than the staining, this works great. But yeah, you're supposed to, you're supposed to trim, cut up vertically and put it in. Yep. Yep. Well, you should have paper behind there. So even if a little bit of water gets through, you'd be fine, in theory, right? OK, so step flashing size. Uh, you know, Now that all our materials require a 2-inch clearance, we're not putting in 2-inch tall step flashings anymore. right? We want to have the step flashing go up behind the finished material. So uh, it's actually in code now, 4-inch tall and 4-inch out. Um, so uh, when I started, all of our houses had uh, either three tab shingles or sometimes architectural shingles. And they all have, ha what, what exposure do all those have? Mick knows. It's a, what's the exposure? Five inch exposure, right. So a step flashing was seven inches tall. Uh, now, what's our exposure on our shingles? Anyone done a Grand Manor lately or one of those? Seven. Yeah, I mean, they have shingles with eight and 10 inch exposures now, asphalt shingles and plus slate and shakes and all that. So now we have to get step flashings that's long enough for the shingles we're actually using. Otherwise, you have to use two per shingle or something. Length is exposure plus two inches. So that's a pretty big step flashing. And this is actually something where, like, if you go to uh, one of our prominent lumber yards, they do not have step flashings that are four inches tall or four inches out or longer than seven inches. They're, all, they're too short in every direction. But you can get them at other places. So just to reiterate, this has probably been our number one issue with roofs, is the fact that the roofers come on and they put everything in front of the Tyvek instead of cutting the Tyvek and putting it up behind it. So let's make sure when we're on the job that that's explained to the people who are installing stuff that the Tyvek has to come out in front. Did you have a question, Jim? No. Okay. So one last thing with uh, sidewall connection, sometimes you have a window in your sidewall and it's really close to the roof level. So uh, feel free to run your underlayment or your roofing membrane, your ice and water guard right up into the window and make, it, make the sill pan uh, work that way. Um, sometimes that's just the only good way to solve it aesthetically and practically. All right, any questions on sidewall connections? All right. So let's look at our masonry connections as kind of a uh, combination of sidewall or chimneys. Um, we've had a lot of leaks on, on these over the years. Uh, you know, many client, people call us after big storms, say, you know, the, the part of the house that you didn't work on is now, I have this drip over my chimney or um, somewhere else. So uh, as we've discussed in other meetings, masonry will absorb a fair amount of water, especially in a wind-driven rain. So you'll have a stack of brick or stone and water's gone all the way to the back of it and is trickling down through all the little pores in the mortar and the space behind the brick. 
And somewhere in that wall, we have to collect all that water and get it out before we get down into the house. Uh, so if you have masonry that goes down through past our roof level, we have to put a through flashing at the roof level where that water hits it and comes out onto the roof or else it's going to drip down into the house. So we're going to... Uh, uh, we're going to play a big role in that because there's two different subs, right? The masons have to bring the masonry above the roof in the right shape. Then the roofers have to do their part, the metal, and then the masons continue on. So there's a fair amount of coordination. Let me just show you the steps. Uh, here's the through flashing installed through the veneer layer. The roofers come along and put their shingles and step flashing. And then they put the counter flashing on, bend over the through flashing. Looks very nice. So here's an example in the middle showing how we've had the masons set up and build these steps. Um, you know, to my eye, there's a lot of steps, and they don't really look all that even. Um, but we'll talk about that. Uh, one thing we have learned is instead of just putting the metal directly on the masonry, we want to wrap it with a peel and stick through flashing material. Um, the, the main advantage of that is the masons have that on site. They're using it at all the windows and lintels. So they can build the, uh, the, pre, the first part of the masonry and then wrap it right away and you're dried in. You're not going to have water pouring in through that joint in the roof. But it's also great as a backup. Um, it's pretty easy to have a pinhole in metal either when you start or after it expands and contracts a lot. So it's nice to have something under the metal that makes it, makes it uh, less likely to leak. So, how are we going to set up these steps so that they're even, they all look good, they're the right height? Um, one of the things we have figured out uh, over the last few years is to hand the masons a piece of 2 by 4 and tell them the inside corner, the bottom corner of all your steps should be this far above the roof deck. So just lay this on the roof and slide your block along or your brick along until the corner is even with the, where the top of that 2 by 4 hits the step below. And that is a, that's a really good way to explain how to get the lower, the inside corners all even. And then if they come up the same height at every step, then the top corner is also going to be even. So the only question is, what's the step we should use? Um, you know, traditionally, well, traditionally, three and a half inches is a lot higher than traditional, right? If you're really looking at a traditional house, you're probably going to be seeing the inside corner about two inches above the roof deck level and then the, the next step up is going to be four to six inches. Um, now with our code requirement for four inch step flashing, three and a half is, you know, doesn't, probably doesn't even really meet code, but it feels like it's pretty good. So we've tried eight inch steps. That's pretty high. Um, it's a big step. So some clients have found that objectionable. Um, so I think we're probably looking at, if you're doing brick, you want to do probably two bricks, which is, you know, five and a half inches. And if you're doing block, you probably want to do four inches to six inches, somewhere in that range. You do all the steps all the same, you get a nice even look. Comes out really nice. If you don't, it can look really weird. Even in irregular stone, the steps probably want to look pretty even. Now on a chimney, uh, we kind of want to do the same thing, but you have to pick how far in you're going to go. So uh, a lot of our masons build a block chimney and they waterproof that. Um, lately we've been using a cementitious waterproofing that will not catch on fire, which I think is probably better than the asphalt-based waterproofing that could catch on fire, which probably doesn't belong in a chimney. Uh, so if you waterproof the outside of the block, then your flashing just has to go through the veneer layer and connect to that waterproofing. Uh, you can also go all the way through the chimney. And this is actually traditional, like in New England and Long Island uh, on, the, on the coasts. They get a lot of windblown rain, and it just soaks all the way through their chimneys. Uh, so they would run a through flashing all the way through the chimney around the roof level. Um, so that can be done. Um, you want to rough up the surfaces or attach little pieces of metal to the surfaces so there's a little bit more friction and the chimney can't slide off the roof. Um, go ahead. Oh. Pitching them and putting weed poles, that's not important. P pitching, pitching the... Pitching the, the shelf. The sh oh. No, I think that's a good idea. And then weed poles? 
Well, so you would have weeps on top of those, just like any through flashing. Yeah, but that actually is a good point because we'll, you'll see in a second um, there is a whole issue that comes up if you do this correctly. Um, you know, again on a chimney, um, there are. It's a little bit harder to do the aesthetics um, on a chimney. Uh, the aesthetics on a chimney are a little bit harder to manage than on a sideball because you, even if you do even steps on each side, there's these corners you have to go around and a, and a peak you have to meet at. Now, luckily, most of these cricket areas like this, you can't even see them, so it's okay if they're a little bit asymmetrical. But it can turn into a little bit of a head scratcher. You know, you might get up there with a ruler and uh, you know a couple of crayons and and do a couple of different versions to make sure you can get around the corners correctly. Uh, I think we I think it took us a couple of tries to sort out this corner area where originally this, the way the steps worked out, we were kind of running into the roof before we could start stepping up the side. So you might have to change the spacing or height on your steps. Um, and I, I was looking at these pictures. I, I just put this one in. Look how wet this stone is. I mean, this is how much water can go through these assemblies. And this is why it's important to have through flashing whenever we have the option to, to build the whole thing. Um, now, Dante, as you were saying, there are weeps on the tops of all these uh, through flashings. Um, and when you have weep holes you, and you have water running through masonry, it brings calcium out. And when the water dries out, it leaves this white efflorescence behind. So. That's a, that's a real issue. Um, the only way I really know to how to solve this is to stop water going through the masonry assembly. Um, how do we do that? Uh, well, one thing we have done that is kind of uh, a standard for us is to use a uh, waterproof, water resisting uh, sealant, a breathable water resisting silane sealant on any chimney. Um, that really reduces how much water gets in. Another thing we can do is pick masonry joints, which unlike this chimney, this is a so-called dry stack where the stones are very close together. You can't actually tool the mortar joints. So the mortar joints are very porous. If you pick a style where you can tool the mortar joints, that helps a lot. Uh, and then the other thing that's important is the cap. Um, one thing that has certainly become clear is that these masonry caps don't keep much water out of the top. I mean. Uh, it's very normal to get up there and find them cracked after two or three years. Uh, and even, the, even if the top itself isn't cracked, you know, as soon as you get around the corner, there's water soaking in through the masonry structure. So one really nice option for clients is to do a metal cap. Um, this costs about the same as rebuilding the mortar cap because you don't have to use scaffolding to get up there and roofers just get up there and do it. Um, so we do a lot of these on retrofit applications. Um, you know, even before we seal all this area with uh, fireproof caulk that won't catch on fire, uh, it's still 99% waterproof already. So that really reduces the amount going through the chimney. And then you just have to clean the efflorescence is the best you can do as far as I can tell. All right, masonry connections, we're all experts now. So um, feel free to bring me out on any of these if you're if you have a, a mason and a roofer, you want to get it all coordinated, I'm happy to come help. Um, we've got some good documentation on that that'll help them un all understand their roles. <clears throat> Hit the wrong button last time. Okay. All right. This is the best chapter. This is the shortest chapter, skylights. Uh, for all the problems we've had with skylights, I do have, there is an easy answer. Buy Veluxes, top of the line, step flash, skylights. Don't worry about it. Go home and sleep well. Um, I think the entire time I've worked here, I've had seen one problem with a Velux skylight uh, that was actually a problem with the skylight. Has anyone else ever seen a Velux? It's, yeah. Some clients put a, a shade under it in a south facing skylight and it melted the sealant. This was in like 1994. Uh, they replaced it for free. Never seen another problem with the Velux skylight. Um, these are super reliable. Um, however, um, so I could end this chapter here, but because we're trying to elucidate the principles of why this would be important so that when a new product comes along, we can evaluate it properly and we understand the reasons for it, let me give you the long answer. Um, the reason that these are great, the flashing kits are awesome. So compared to a site-made flashing kit, uh, the factory built top and bottom pieces have a factory made outside corner that you cannot duplicate in the field 
without soldering copper. So all the other metals we use, aluminum, steel, cannot be soldered in the field. And there's always a joint that can never be properly sealed at each of the four corners of a skylight. But if you buy one from the factory, it comes with the four corners sealed properly. Step flashing is also really important. They do, companies do make skylights that don't have step flashing. And what happens is the water gets into the, uh, under the roofing at the top and works its way down. And then it gets under the flashing at the bottom and it comes in. With step flashings, it keeps getting kicked out every few inches. So the step flashings work a lot better. Uh, these units are glass. That lasts a lot longer than acrylic, has a lot fewer problems. We've replaced a lot of acrylic skylights. I mean, they just don't last very long. Um, condensation management is also very important. A lot of homemade skylights don't have a, a gutter where water that drips off the glass or acrylic uh, gets thrown to the outside. The Veloxes do. So as usual, follow the directions. Um, we did have a spate of issues with skylights that one particular roofer was installing uh, below the pitch that it said in the book. And he said, oh, it's fine. Don't, I've done 100 of these. And I, I'm not sure 100 of them are leaking, because every one that he did for us is leaking. But if you follow the directions, no issues with this. OK? Any questions on skylights? And the pitch is usually a 4 and 12, is sort of the magic number? Or? It used to be 4 and 12. They now say 3 and 12. Yeah, but that confuses things. I didn't want to admit that, but that's true. And then for lower slopes, they do sell the. So for lower slopes, you build a water. T it's a long, complicated story. Yeah, um, to get it to 4 and 12, where the, where the <clears throat> skylight sits? No, there are skylights that work on low slope. But for steep slope roofing, this is the way to go. Got it. Yeah. OK, any questions on skylights? Great. All right, let's talk about materials. As I said, each of these has their own thing. Um, most of the, everything we've talked about applies to asphalt. Very simple materials. Um, everybody knows how to do this. Um, these, I didn't update the prices in the last year. Uh, I think asphalt shingles may actually be on their way down because the price of oil happens to be falling this week. But we'll see how that goes. Um, so cedar shakes and shingles, um, they, they don't, one thing we do know about these is they don't seem to hold up all that well. Uh, I think saying 15 or 20 years is pretty realistic. People who have roofs that are older than that have done have to do multiple repairs, replace a couple hundred shingles, that kind of thing. Um, the interesting thing with cedar shakes is that there needs to be air underneath them for water to evaporate out of the bottom of the shingles, or they rot out very quickly, and sometimes they even curl. So there are two ways to do that. One is skip sheathing, where instead of using plywood, you actually put one by fours or one by sixes on top of the rafters. Uh, and we've actually done a couple of houses that way. Um, but the other way is to use cedar breather, which you can see up here at the top, where they haven't covered it with felt yet. It's, uh, it's a, um, a non-woven mesh that just makes a space. And when you nail the shingles down on top of them with the nail gun, it doesn't push it down. It leaves a space. So the water vapor that's going through the wood can evaporate out to the bottom almost as easily as the top. And that really helps them last longer. That's actually in code now. Uh, shakes, you can see they're interleaving felt here in the picture on the right. On the left is a picture of a shingle roof. Because the shingles are much more flat, you don't need to interleave the felt into them. All right, slate is a really great roof. Um, I lived in Vermont for a while, and there's a bunch of roofs around there. Like, there's one right up the road from my parents' house that says 1881 on it. And I think they probably replaced some of those slates. but. It's, it lasts, I mean, it really lasts, right? If you get a good slate roof, um, it can be way longer than our lifespan. Um, and it costs a lot, but it's a very nice roof. It turns out that there are good slates and there are mediocre slates. Um, we, you know, there's uh, Vermont's and Virginia's, those are very good. Um, Spanish slate is pretty good and Canadian's pretty good. There's been an issue apparently where People are buying cheap slates and saying that they're Spanish because, I mean, they're just rocks. They don't have a factory stamp on them. So you've got to be careful to make sure you're sourcing them correctly. Uh, and then there's a lot of slates that have come into the market recently from all over the world, which may not be that good. Um, people have had issues very quickly with, with some of them, freeze thaw or color fading. So you know, be careful of what you're selling to people. Um, we've been using a lot of Vermont and Virginia. 
Um, one th funny thing with a 150 year roof is, uh, you know, what are you going to use for vent caps? What are you going to use for nails? What are you going to use for uh, your plumbing caps? Uh, all these things probably should be designed to last longer than 20 or 30 years, which most of the stuff that's on the market is designed to last 20 or 30 years. They're made of uh, galvanized steel and they just don't last that long. So, I mean, this is a synthetic slate roof, but it's supposed to last 50 years, so we probably shouldn't have put a nail on it that started rusting in five. So, uh, copper or stainless steel nails for long lifespan roofs, things that'll last. And uh, obviously, because steel corrodes copper and aluminum, you gotta keep those away from copper and aluminum roofs. All right, so speaking of simulated slate, um, you know, the, the good news on simulated slate is we've found one that seems to work great. Um, it's really lightweight, so you can put it over any existing roof, unlike a regular slate, which is so heavy, sometimes you have to reinforce even the rafters. So people have a historic house, they want a slate roof, this is the way to go. Um, the EcoStar is the one kind that we've had good luck with. Um, so not very expensive, you can get a 50 year warranty, uh, would I bet my life that those will be working, looking good in 50 years? Not really. Um, wouldn't matter anyway, I, I'm, unless they come up with some new medical stuff. I probably won't be around to verify that either way, but um, it's been very good for us. We've never had a warranty issue, never had a real problem. The only thing to be careful of is that you have to blend all of them because they come out in different colors. In fact, this is a picture that Wagner sent us. They did this job in two phases and you can see one of the batches came out a little different. Um, this is uh, a project we did not do, but this is a, in Potomac. Um, you can see what it looks like if you don't mix your slates. It's a really bad look. This is a job we did do. All of these were the same color when we put them on, but uh, our roofer blended them correctly. And then over the, I think we did this in 99, so this is a 16-year-old roof. Um, they faded in different directions. You know, it looks like a slate roof uh, because we mixed it all. There's uh, a couple of other brands that are, have been out for almost 10 years now, which we might be ready to give a try to, Da Vinci and Symphony. Um, but I'm really wary of this category. A lot of products have come out and failed and gone off the market. Uh, Lamorite and Duraslate prominently. Uh, this is a Duraslate roof. Um, there's this place where you kind of have to slide down to jump off a part. And, uh, you know, it looks like the top layer must be oxidizing in the sun or something. I don't know. It doesn't give you a good feeling about how long it's going to last. Uh, and one category I can definitely say to avoid is fiber, cement, shingles. There have been, I think, probably tw on the order of 20 companies have gone out of business making those. Um, all of them have failed. I don't know of a single successful fiber cement roofing. So definitely steer away from those. All right, um, metal roofing has its charms. It's really um, has a nice look. It's kind of expensive, but it's super durable. Um, particularly if you repaint it, it should it can last you know 100, 200 years if you keep up on the maintenance. Um, you know, uh, Joe Stebrek has a, an article about metal roofs. He says all metal roofs leak some, and I do think that's true. So the underlayment is very important. I mean, all these roofs have. Uh, connections where just a little bit of water is going to get in under some circumstances. So uh, it's very important to make sure that you get all the ice guard membrane and everything right on those. Copper is a beautiful, beautiful roof. Um, copper prices go way up and way down. It's been really weird. I'm not 100% not sure what that's all about, but uh, since all wires and all motors are made with copper, I guess whenever everyone in the world decides they need wiring and motors, then the price goes through the roof. Um, one funny thing with copper is it leaves green deposits as the copper runs off. So there's actually a line uh, right, right in front of that arrow um, of, dr of little green spots. And we ended up adding gutters to this roof just to prevent the pool deck from turning green. We've done it. Congratulations. Does anyone have any questions about steep slope roofing? Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone, for coming in. Really appreciate it.